The election campaign is now, of course, entering the home straight, and over the next few days, we can uh, expect the arguments to become even more tense, as all the parties make their final pitch for votes. During the week, the Prime Minister has been feeling the heat on assorted subjects, and, uh, and now we're going to talk to him about the third term, question mark, the third term. He's here now. We've seen you all week. I'm leaning down there to pick up my notes. Um, the, we've seen you all week with Gordon, but you're here... You've come out solo. <laughs> yep, yeah, I'm on my own this morning. All right, well, good luck then without Gordon. Gordon will be watching, won't you? I, I, I don't know, but I assume he will. <laughs> um, he always makes a point of watching your programme, yeah. I'm sure. Well, that, that's <laughs> the correct answer. Now, the, um, first of all, the thing, what, what about this campaign? I mean, everybody says it's been an incredibly negative uh, campaign on both sides and in a sense kicked off by Labour with that uh, the Tories would cut 35 billion pounds from public services when that's 2011 and it's not a cut it's a lower increase um, but why has it been so negative? Well you know at the same time we were pointing out that the, the, the cuts that the Conservatives are going to make to our programs we were also putting forward positive plans for the economy and for the National Health Service and for schools and for law and order. I mean, I think the, the, the key thing is that we, over the next few days, make sure we are debating those issues. I mean, those are the things that matter to people. I mean, they want to know what's going to be the future of the economy and uh, how can you help uh, new homeowners and create more jobs and have the rising minimum wage we yeah. want and so on. And how do we make sure the investment in schools and hospitals is matched by real results yeah. there? And, but but the I think that is the... Yeah, but at the same time, I mean, we've, I quoted a couple of... Uh, Tory candidates things last week to Michael Howard, but I mean, here's your parliamentary candidate for Lewis East saying uh, 12,000 pensioners benefit from the £200 winter fuel allowance, which will be taken away by the Tories, along with the free TV licences for the over 75. Well, they've said a million times that's just not true. I mean, it shouldn't be in Labour propaganda. Yeah, but the question is, how do the Tories pay for their plans for pensioners where they say they're going to offer them other things in circumstances where they've got these massive spending commitments. Look, I think we're perfectly entitled to, to have an economic debate with the Tories. In fact, we, we've actually been trying to put the economy centre stage in the election campaign and they've been running away from it. But the real issue is this. We've set out our economic plans. We're happy to have them under scrutiny. They have got a plan, though, which at one and the same time is to cut people's taxes but also spend more money and that doesn't work and you, you end up with your you know going back to the, the problems we had before so we're saying economic stability is at the heart of the campaign now on the health service we're putting forward a positive program for the health service but, but I think we're entitled to point out yeah, that yeah, they're taking money out yeah, of the NHS but, but the you're entitled to say anything in fact <laughs> no, but I mean entitled as part true. of a debate but look here's another candidate who says the Conservatives are committed to an immediate cut of immediate cut <clears> of 20 billion to public services well it's not true I, I'm, no. have, you, have you seen? You have to disown that. Well, th that you? is not correct. No, they're not. They're not committed to an immediate cut of 20 billion. They are, however, committed in this 35 billion pound programme, which is to reduce our forward spending programmes by 35 billion. And that's over, the, well, over seven over the years, six or no, seven no, years. It's, it's, no, they say 2011. Well, 2010-11 is where you get to. But if you take it, that the plans that we have published, I think by year three it is 20 billion pounds less. And the, the issue that we've constantly raised is how can you say that when at the same time other Conservative spokesmen are making great spending commitments and you've got these tax cut commitments? And what we're saying is, look, that is an economic mess. That's why the economy is at stake. Uh, over the past eight years, you've had low interest rates, low inflation, low unemployment. Don't put it at risk. Now, I think, you, you know, you asked what's wrong with the campaign. And I think, it's a, if I can respectfully say so, it's a an intelligent question to ask, what is wrong with the campaign? What is wrong with it is that we're not debating the policy issues. I mean, you'll always get a mix of positive and negative. I don't think that's the question. The question is, why last week were we not talking about the economy, the NHS, schools, law and order? In fact, the only time we talked about the NHS was when I was talking about NHS targets and how we might shift them. But, but you both focus, you focus on Michael Howard, that's personalising it. Uh, he focuses on you, that's personalising well, it. No, so I, I so you, all, you all don't uh, go to the issues. You, all, well, you, with you, respect, you think people, people, the way Michael Howard looks, might win you a few votes? I don't know, that's going to win us a few votes, but I think pointing out his record when in government is perfectly okay. That's not a personal attack, it's not a piece of abuse, if you like. Um, you're entitled to say, you know, remember his opposition, the minimum wage or the Tory economic record and so on. I think you're entitled to do that. 
what we are at the same time doing, and the frustrating thing for us, frankly, David, is that we're not able to get publicity for this, is we are also setting out forward policies. You know, we've published proposals which I think are very important to help first-time buyers, young couples, get their feet on the first rungs of the housing ladder. Now, you can argue that's right, you can argue it's wrong. Let's have a debate about it. I mean, I, I tried having a debate the other day about student finance and say, look, this is a big controversial issue, but let's debate the alternative proposals of the parties as to how you fund universities and students yeah. in today's world. The frustrating thing, I think, I mean, if, if we're absolutely blunt about it, is that so much of it has focused on going back over you know, issues to do with the past rather than issues to do yeah, with the future. Well, some of those are still relevant today on the front, <clears throat> on the front pages, but um, I mean, what would you say is, where, where would the majority make you comfortable? I mean, people say you'd be uncomfortable at 40 or 50 because you wouldn't be able to have your way. Um, therefore, you really need a majority of over 100. Um, do you, assuming for a moment that you win somewhere in that range, um, do you have a preference? Do you know, when I, <laughs> when I have this type of conversation, there's a chill goes down my spine. Yeah. We have not won this election yet. And the conservative strategy I keep pointing out to people, I think with some justification, is not to get in by the front door. It's to hope that in seats where the conservatives are second, you get enough people opting out and voting Lib Dem to let the conservatives in by the back door. We haven't won this election yet. There is, electoral history is littered with examples of parties ahead in the opinion polls who end up losing elections. And the f surest way to start losing elections is to start discussing yeah. my majority oh, oh, when I haven't got one. Yeah, when you haven't got one. Uh, but a small majority might make it difficult to put through your programme of reform. Well, it's important we put through the programme of reform, but in the end people should vote how they feel and what they judge. And, and the, the key thing for the country is to is over these next few days when we go out, as I will be today, and saying this is what we can do in the National Health Service. We've made these changes and improvements, but here's how we can get to a maximum 18-week wait. Here's how we can refurbish and rebuild every secondary school school in the, in the country. Here's how we can put neighbourhood policing teams out on the, the beat. In. Let's debate that. Well, well, and then we'd have a, right, an well, election worth and the issue really is, fighting about. The issue really is leadership, and we've read all these polls and so on, that... that uh, people have lost a lot of their old trust in your leadership. Um, how do you put that right? I think you, you... Look, when you do this job, you take difficult decisions, and there's a wear and tear that comes with that. But in the end, the question people have got to ask themselves is, who do you trust to run the economy? Who do you trust to make the changes, not just investing in health and education, but make the changes necessary to get rising standards in them? Who do you trust to deal with the big issues that confront this country? And, you know, I'm happy to have a debate about leadership, yeah. but let that debate be around the issues that face the country and the tough decisions necessary to get there. You see, anyone can say, it's like, uh, you know, the, 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 the Lib Dem proposals on um, tuition fees and all the rest of it. Anyone can go out and say, I want to get rid of tuition fees. I want to abolish the council tax. I want to give you everything you want for free. It's not leadership, though. Leadership is about saying there are tough choices that need to be made, hard decisions which may offend some people. But in the end, that is what leadership's about. And the only reason we've been able to deliver, for example, economic stability is that we took the tough decisions of Bank of England independence, tight fiscal rules, and a dedicated approach to economic management. The only reason we got change in the health service is we, we were prepared to take on some of the people who were standing in the way of those changes. But all the people who, who <clears throat> apparently now half the electorate or whatever, seem not to trust you. I mean, maybe it would be better to have a different leader. I mean, Charles Kennedy or Michael Howard, I mean. Oh, people have got to make up their minds about that. But you know, a lot of this leadership has, has revolved, frankly, around the issue of Iraq. Now, I took a difficult decision there. You, you've got a situation where last week, Mr. Howard eventually had to admit he would have taken the same decision. And Charles Kennedy advanced the extraordinary proposition that if only we'd let the weapons inspector stay a little bit longer in Iraq, the Iraqi people would have risen up and deposed Saddam. I mean, you know, this isn't the real world. The real world was you had to take a decision about whether to take Saddam out, put him in prison, or leave him in power. I decided to put him in prison. Well, then, but, a, with, you know, with respect, when you say that, and that always sounds, uh, when you say it, very, very uh, persuasive, um, and you are <laughs> the persuader. Well, it may be just because it's, it may be yeah. it's, it's persuasive because it's right. But. Well, but no, the, I think it's wrong, really, or it's not altogether true, because, in fact, you had another choice, which was not to go to war, 
because you knew that President Bush would do it anyway, the result would be the same, and we could have, we could have not gone to war. In fact, Bush very sweetly at one stage gave that offer to the Brits, as you know, and Donald Rumsfeld talked about it publicly, that if, uh, if in fact Britain can't go to war, then they can help in other ways, and there'll be a, a way around it, and then they can come in later. We, we, Saddam would have been got rid of by George Bush on his own, and we could have saved lives by not taking part. There was that alternative. Well, I don't know that the Americans would have done it, but let's assume that they would have for a moment. So we, the British, at the moment of decision, would have faltered and backed off. I, I, don't, I don't think that, that's, that's not uh, my conception of Britain. And look, in the end, why is it that in, in, these, in this last two weeks of the election campaign, both the Conservative Party and the Liberal Democrats want to talk about Iraq. Why is it? I mean, and let me just su suggest to you why. It is because they want to go back over the past about Iraq because they have nothing serious to say about the future of Britain. Not on the economy, where they lost the argument, or on the health service, where they lost the argument, or on schools, where they've lost the argument, even on some of the Conservative issues like law and order and immigration, where actually if you put our policy up against theirs, we fare pretty well. Now, that's what people have got to ask themselves, is why is it that in these last couple of weeks they've suddenly tried to turn this into an issue yeah. about me personally. Well, well, Why? <laughs> and well, the answer to I that, the, I think, I is think very the clear. the reason is that it's such a, a big issue still. I mean, why is David Frost getting out of the Sunday Times here? <laughs> Why is he doing that? Well, it's because there's this revelation of the meeting, of the uh, secret Downing Street memo of the 23rd of July, which, according to everybody who we've heard on the news this morning, indicates that your mind was made up much earlier than we thought, uh, that you were talking about the regrettable not being able to use regime change, and, and that at the end of this uh, particular thing from July the 23rd... 2002. Says, 2002, exactly. which is, which is much, much earlier than we in the nation thought that you had made up your mind. We did not know, and if we had known then, and that Jack, and that Jack Straw had said they, were, they weren't really a danger anyway, and the C CDS, the Chief of Defence Staff, would send the Prime Minister full details of the proposed military campaign and possible UK contributions by the end of the week. This is very, very well advanced, and we didn't know that. And you weren't saying anything like that at the time. Now, it may simply be that a p political leader cannot tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Maybe that's impossible, but we ought to have known about that sooner. That predates the United Nations resolution in November 2002. The fact is, of course, all the time, what you're thinking of is what, what happens if we can't do this in a peaceful way. But what happened subsequent to that meeting was that we went the United Nations route. You know, we went back to the United Nations in November to give them a last chance. And, uh, you know, there will be people who keep rerunning these arguments the entire time. I mean, I haven't even looked at some of the stuff that's in the papers this morning. It's been gone over by inquiry after inquiry. They've all come to the same conclusion. In the end, you had a decision. Was Saddam to be left there or not? And I took that decision. And I, I don't... The one thing I've always said, and I've said this constantly over the past few weeks, I've never disrespected someone who took the opposite point of view. No, I know. What I disrespect is when someone says, actually, you could have backed away, left Saddam in power, and something else would have happened to have removed Saddam and his sons. No, it wouldn't. In the end, you had a tough choice, and that embraced yeah, what leadership's but, about. But it says here that, um, that obviously, uh, it seemed clear that Bush had made up his mind to take military action, and uh, goes on to plan your military action, and your remarks would indicate here that you really made up your mind pre the UN back in, because this is a hell of a detailed meeting just for a discussion. But of course you, you, you've got to discuss everything as you go along, but what happened after that meeting is that we decided to go back to the United Nations and give him a last chance. And if, as I've constantly said to people, if the UN resolution had been adhered to by Saddam, then that would have been an end of it, even despite the fact that there was the most appalling regime in Iraq. But the fact is, as is clear from the evidence subsequently, he never had any intention of giving up um, his, his ambitions, both in respect of his own country and in respect of the region. But, you know, again, we're coming back to these issues, you know, in the last few days, when on Thursday, 
The issue before the country is not what happened in the past in Iraq. We can debate that, and I'm not saying it's not an issue for people. It's what's going to happen in the future yeah, in Britain. Yeah. No, and we'll come on to that. But the point was, that in the same week that you were being so definite there, you were saying in the House of Commons that there were no plans for military action. Which we have taken true, no decision. That's maybe, maybe that's no, no, because no, no, we've taken, you can't tell the truth, no, the whole no, truth, it's, and nothing it's not, but the It's truth. not a question of that. Of course, you have always got to be acting on the basis of whatever may come up. You don't know what's going to arise from that. But the idea that we had decided definitively for military action at that stage is wrong and disproved by the fact that several months later, we went back to the United Nations to get a final resolution. And actually, the conflict didn't begin until four months after that despite the fact that actually Saddam had been given, I think it was, uh, he, he had to comply immediately and unconditionally with the weapons inspectors. And the other point is the weapons inspectors have never been back in there, but for 250,000 UK and US troops down his doorstep. So, anyway. Yeah. anyway, we'll move on, but, but the Foreign Office were also saying at that time that it was illegal. No, what, the, what everyone was saying is, you've got to get a fresh UN resolution. Mm. That's what we then went and got. And then the question after that, um, was, well, is that enough, or do you need to get even another one? And that was the issue politically, that was the issue legally. But it, it, it's a... How, how much did the war cost, and the follow-up? Well, uh, Gordon's given the figures on that. I think it's roughly four and a half billion, if you take it all the way through. And did you agree with Gordon when he said the other day that, in fact, the Commons should always constitutionally have the last vote about going to war? I think what he said was exactly what I've said, which is that if you've got the opportunity, I mean, sometimes you may have to take military action and you've got no, you know, no time to go to the House of Commons. You may have to act immediately in the interest of the country. But what I said at the time of the Iraq war, remember, we gave Parliament the vote. Mm. <laughs> but should you, should it, that be it, voluntary or should that be instituted? I mean, you would give, you would give the Commons the vote if this sort of thing happened again? I, I think that it will always be the case, as I've, and I've said this before, in sense, I'm saying nothing new, and neither was Gordon, he was saying exactly what I've said. In circumstances where it's possible, because you, you've got the time to, to, to go through a parliamentary procedure, it seems to me sensible to do it. Um, but, you know, there may be situations in which you can't do that, and I, I don't see any need to, to change the convention. So you wouldn't, it's just yeah, you wouldn't want reality. to give that simple pledge about, about the Commons having the last vote because sometime the circumstances you say wouldn't allow it? Well, there can be circumstances in which you, you, you just have to act immediately to safeguard the interests of the country. Uh, and incidentally, as I say, Gordon was saying precisely that. It's just that I've already made it clear, if, if you can give people a vote, give them a vote. And in this instance we did, yeah. which is sometimes mm -hmm. forgotten. And on the subject of Europe, um, General, uh, <coughs> President Chirac is obviously uh, in some difficulties at the moment, trying to persuade a yes vote on May the 29th for the mm. Constitution. Um, if he asked you to come over and help him, would you go? Well, I haven't had that invitation. I doubt I'll get it. Uh, <laughs> you know, because as you know, the great issue over there for France is both sides are arguing about, is this an Anglo-Saxon plot, this Constitution? Mm. Which is very odd when you have the debate here, which is, is this a French plot or not? Mm. So, but anyway, that's but, the But you've got, you've got the presidency coming up, of course, on July the 1st. Um, if indeed the French do vote no, that means the Constitution is dead. But he also said, um, you agree with that? I, I don't think you can tell that. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I mean, you, you just, uh, you'd have to wait and see what France itself said in the event of a no vote. They haven't voted no yet, however, no. as well. So but we'd still, even if they, voted no, would, close, if, if they voted no, would we still have a vote? Absolutely. Or, or would everybody else say, that's it, no, no more votes required? No, I, th there will be a vote in this country if there's still a constitution to vote on. Hmm. There will be, yeah. yes. And you, think, and you think there will be, a, that they'll get round this? Uh... I, I honestly don't know. I mean, it, it's, uh, you know, you, you just can't tell. Um, my belief is that, that people will try to find a way around it. Whether it's possible to find a way around, I don't know. Um, I mean, it may be that, that, that uh, you know, well, yeah, I think it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's just, you're going to have to wait and see what happens when they vote no and what the French government then says. Um, and, you know, rather than be speculated about it, we might as well wait for the result. And so at the moment, there could still be a referendum on the Constitution. There will in the next... Yeah, I mean, I'm certainly the anticipating that, that, that there will be, yeah. Yeah, will be, in, in fact, in that sense. And uh, in terms of uh, the other countries in the world, we just don't know in Europe how they will fare. No, you, you did once say we don't need a Constitution anyway, I mean... 
But that was a long time ago. Well, in my view, if, you, if you've been able to change, the, the reason I think you do need the Constitution is not for some of the reasons people were giving at the time. Indeed, some of those things we had to knock out of the Constitution. The reason you do need a change of rules in Europe, you know, however you describe this, whether it's a treaty or a, a constitutional treaty or however you describe it, is that you can't carry on running Europe in this way. When you've got 25 countries around that table, soon to be 27, then 28, then possibly 30 or more, you can't have this six-month rotating presidency that Britain will have in a few weeks' time. It's just a, it's a hopelessly uh, inefficient way of doing business. So, in my view, there, are, there is a strong case for changing the, the mechanisms by which Europe makes decisions. There isn't, though, in my view, a strong case for changing, for example, the ability of this country to set its own tax rates, decide its own foreign policy and defence. We've got to retain those as uh, parts of our sovereignty. And, in fact, um, in terms of changing things, you've said you're going to change some of the targets that seem excessive or too complicated well, in the NHS? Yeah, I mean, I think that, that this is an important debate, and again, it's, it would be, it'd be good if it had been part of the election campaign. I've got no doubt at all we needed strong, tough targets to start forcing change within the public services. After all, we're putting a vast amount of public money into health and education. We're the only country anywhere in the world, um, major country, increasing public spending on health and education as a proportion of our national income every year. Now, you need performance as a result of that. And I think that targets, for example, an accident in emergency departments, targets for the improvement of literacy and numeracy in um, primary and, uh, schools, I think these targets have been important in engineering change. But as we move to the next stages of reform, for example, you're going to have in the health service a system where you've got a single tariff and people will have the choice to go to different hospitals and so on. When you start introducing those types of different structures, then I think you can ease up, you know, you can strip down the targets to those that are clearly necessary and make them more flexible. I mean, let me give you another example that people have been talking about, and that is it is important that we get this planning preparation assessment time for teachers in primary schools, but the primary school head teachers are worried that they're not going to have sufficient resource or time for their teachers to be able to do it. That's a classic example of something we've got to sit down and work out a way through with them and, and you know this is the targets have been a necessary part of getting change but they shouldn't be rigid or inflexible would you like to see half as many targets as there are now or two-thirds or what well we already have for example I think in the health service I think I'm right in saying we've halved the targets there we're trying to halve them in schools too I think I'm right in saying I have to check the exact figures on that law and order as well but on the other hand you know when we had the, that really big street crime problem in London where it was just, you know, shooting up the whole time. It was only when we, you know, really forced the system to change that, that we got the reductions that we need. So, you know, I still think that public service reform must continue alongside investment, and some of that reform, opening up the secondary school system to new suppliers, you know, proceeding with the city academy and specialist schools. You know, some of that's got to go faster and further. Uh, same with the health service. Some of the things we've done in the health service have plainly worked by opening up, you know, the, the ability to use the independent sector, still free at the point of use, of course. But, um, you know, these are changes that I think are necessary for a better public service. And the thing that has always driven me about this is I want public services that are universal public services dependent on need, not ability to pay. But I don't believe you'll get the public consent for the money for that unless it's clear they're delivering high standards and high quality. Yes, I mean, the, the thing is, obviously public services are very important. At the same time, there are people who uh, are frightened by this from the point of view of it seeming like almost a, a communist regime. I'm quoting here uh, from, from the recent report here that some regions in Britain are as dependent on the state as some Soviet bloc countries were at the time communism collapsed. Uh, the Centre for Economic and Business Research said that, for instance, in Ireland, government spending accounts for 67% of the region's GDP. In Wales and the North East, 60%, Scotland and North West, 50%. That's too high, isn't it? I don't, you know, when these statistics come out like that, I don't quite know what they mean. I mean, what, what do they mean when they say it's 60% or 67% in the public sector in Northern Ireland? I suppose. I mean, there will be a lot of people who are employed in the health service and in schools and so on and in the police force, but is that, is that a bad thing? I mean, the, the question is, is the overall economy strong and are we generating wealth in the private sector too? I, I think that the economy is very strong, so I don't quite know what they mean when they say that. But. Right. Uh, 
something that I do know what you mean on, because you, you said it here first, uh, Prime Minister, was when you said that you were going to, and everybody will be thinking of this again on, when they vote on Thursday, that you were going to, in fact, serve the whole, the full term, and that the full term meant the full term, etc. Um, how would the next leader be selected then? Because he couldn't be selected after the election. He'd have to be selected while you were Prime Minister, wouldn't he, in the few months before? Is that how it worked? Yes, I mean, uh, it, you know, it, it's it's not unknown this, and in any sense, what do you I mean? Was, it's like America. Or? Well, it's actually like, if you think about it, like our own system here, because as I always say to people, on the assumption I don't go on for an eternity, which I'm quite sure people would not want, uh, there's going to become a point in time at some point where there's a handover. Now, I've said I'll serve the full term. I mean, I kept being asked, are you going to go on and on and on, or are you about to leave? And I said, no, I'll, I'll serve the, the next term, but I'm not going to fight the one after that. And, you know, the, the, the party structures are, are easily implemented nowadays. It's not a, a great problem. But, I mean, he'll be selected, or she will be selected, um, while you're still Prime Minister, obviously, because there's got to be... Well, you, you've got to get a new party leader, yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, at, at, at that time. But, you know, I think you can leave the, the details to another moment. I mean, the main thing is to get through next Thursday. Yeah, yes, the, uh, but people say that the, the, the orderly transition from you to Gordon has already begun. Well, again, you know, I, I think I answer these questions the whole time and I've always, I think one of the things that's come across in the course of the campaign is how strongly we, we work together and will continue to work together. But I don't think it helps him, let alone me, if I start speculating on, you know, what's going to happen when no, There was when a significant change in the Times this week. Instead of saying Gordon would make a great Prime Minister, you said will make a great Prime Minister. Well, I'm, I've always said that he, 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 he'd be a fantastic Prime Minister. I've always said that. But, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't really help anyone to go in and out of all the, the, the permutations that could happen in the future. It doesn't actually help him. But, you know, it's, it's not a bad um, recommendation on your CV to have been the most successful Chancellor in this country for decades. But so. So, so, in a sense, though, leading up to that moment, it'll be, for the next term, it would be a sort of joint premiership no, <laughs> no? no you, you, you've only got one prime minister but it is a strong team and it's not actually simply myself and Gordon if if you look at what's happening in uh, um, the other departments where there's real public service reform being driven through in health and education uh, in the field of law and order you know that there are strong parts of our team there the entire time I mean I think Jack Straw's done a fantastic job as foreign secretary you know, he's also a major player in the government. And the government, it does work far more like a team nowadays. And, and I think that's, that's as it should be. And, and in a sense, you know, right. when you're in opposition, it tends all to focus around the leader. But when you're in government, it shouldn't. And that strong team's an advantage for us. Well, we must get an update on the headlines. But you, let me put it simply, you hope and expect that he would be Prime Minister. I think I've said all I really... <laughs> And can you, you, well, did, you can did, usually you say. Did say will. You did say will. <laughs> now an update on the news headlines from Moira Stewart. Thank you, David. All the main party leaders have a day of intense campaigning ahead of them, with the war in Iraq again one of the main themes. The Lib Dems say Tony Blair will continue to be haunted by the issue unless he agrees to a full independent inquiry. Labour say all the concerns have been addressed. Michael Howard has accused the Prime Minister of tricking the Cabinet and deceiving the Commons in the build-up to the conflict. A man was shot dead by police in North London last night while officers were carrying out a planned operation. He was one of three men travelling in a car which was stopped by detectives in Edgware. Officers have confirmed that a firearm was recovered from the scene. The other two men in the car are being questioned by police. That's all from me for now. Next news on BBC One is at 12 noon. Back to you, David. Thank you very much indeed, Maura. Uh, we're at almost at the end of our time. Do you, on the subject of immigration, the figure for the last recorded year of 150,000, is that too much, too little, or about right? Well, those are the people given settlement rights. Yes. But if we introduce the controls in immigration, you know, the new point system and so on, that yes. we're suggesting, you know, making sure that, that, that people coming to study here can't abuse the system, you'll probably have a, a reduction in numbers coming in. But I am wholly opposed 
to some sort of arbitrary quota or, or to, to start binding business up with all sorts of red tape. Um, when in our economy, precisely because it's strong and because it's an open economy, you need people to come in and, and work and study in this country, and it does good for our, our country. And when we're talking about the problems of immigration, let's not forget that people who are immigrants into this country also make a fantastic contribution to it. Well, we're at the end of our time, but uh, on the euro, just by the way, um, <coughs> should we still hope for a vote on the euro in your next term if you're elected? Depends on the economic circumstances, you know, and uh, it, it's that, that's that's one part of Europe that cannot be determined by politics alone. It's got to be determined on the British national economic interest. Thank you very much, Prime Minister. Thank you. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for being with us too. Do join us again at the same time next week. Until then, top of the morning. Good morning. Next on BBC One, Sir Alan Sugar on the Heaven and Earth show. A pint of bitter and a packet of plain crisps, please. Life's annoying when you only get half what you ask for. That's why on The Politics Show we tell the whole story. From the politics in the news to the breaking stories you haven't read about yet. We'll bring you a local and a national perspective. From Downing Street to your street. A pint, please. The Politics Show. Today, 12 o'clock on BBC One.